Welcome back, AP. All right. It's being recorded in my living room, which is kind of unfortunate. But So the big thing about it, though, is where we left off in class, we were talking about the flight to Varin, right? We were talking about the escape attempt, the terribly stupid escape attempt by the royals to try and get to Austria by way of finding a loyal army of about 10,000 of them, we believe, that was going to be stationed in a city called Varin, which is about, about 120 miles outside of Paris, right? And of course, everything went sideways. The plan was fine at first with Axel von Fiersen's idea with two carriages and all this other stuff. But then Louis is like, let's take one carriage with Thick Thorthus because I'm dumb. And then also we like learned that he writes a letter declaring of all these like negative things that are going to look really, really bad Like whenever like he actually gets captured. Um, he also does all these other negative things. Like he does a duck and he gets recognized by a coin. And then on top of everything else, he like way overestimated the belief in his mind that he thought that the people outside of Paris still supported him. That's why he got out of the carriage and like him and Marie Antoinette gave silver dishes to poor people in the countryside. Because he was like, oh, it's only the crazy people in Paris that don't like me. So anyway... But as we know, big fat failure, right? And as we know, Marquis de Lafayette, heavy player in this story because he's going to show up for a surprise inspection, come in for the morning one, realize that something's wrong, send people out in all directions. He eventually finds them, and over about five days, it takes him a little while to get them back, right? And so once they all get back, there's a massive crowd of people that assemble inside of Paris, right? The day that they arrive back, I think it's like June 25th, all right? So like June 25th, 1791, they arrive back to a mob of people throwing rocks at the carriage, freaking out and having these massive demands. And guess who's in that crowd? Maximilian Robespierre, Jean-Paul Marat, right? They're in that crowd and they're demanding that the monarchy be abolished or at least there be a referendum to vote on the fate of the monarchy itself, right? And so they're throwing rocks, they're freaking out, but the Marquis de Lafayette and his troops get the royals safely back to the Tuileries, and they store them back in there and replace them under house arrest under heavier guard so they can't escape again, right? A lot of people also feel like People like Maximilian Rose here and Jean-Paul Marat. And also their other third guy that they have now, a guy named George Danton, right? So George Danton. They are all believing that the Marquis de Lafayette, he's a sellout, right? He's a sellout. He wants them to stay alive. He wanted them to try and escape. He's just saving face, blah, 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 blah. So like, as you can see, we're seeing divisions in the revolutionary mindset, right? And no event characterizes the divisions in the revolutionary mindset more than the Champs, the Champs de Ma Massacre. Massacre, right? So like the Champ de Mans is a very, very, very large park today in Paris, France, right? But what happened about a month after the flight, a huge crowd of people assembled in protest in the middle of this park, right? And the Marquis de Lafayette and his troops get called in to suppress this mob because they don't want another storming of the Bastille on their hands. They don't want the Tuileries to be raided, which would be terrible, right? They don't want any of these negative things to happen. But what ends up going down is as the crowd refuses to leave, the Marquis de Lafayette has to try and figure out a way to get them to disperse. And yet again, in this crowd is Jean-Paul Marat and Maximilian Rose Pierre throwing documents, freaking out. And then the Marquis de Lafayette begins to see the poor people in the crowd loading their weapons, as you can see right here, right? And then so what he tells his troops, fire above them, fire above them, fire over their heads to get them to freak out and run. And what ends up happening is that only inspires the poor more to fight. And the Marquis de Lafayette is forced to tell the National Guard to fire on a group of people in revolutionary France. Do you see what I mean when I say let's get radical? Things are getting very strange. You're seeing different perspectives on the revolution take force. This is another view of the Champ de Mar massacre. Now, according to Lafayette, about 10 people died at this. According to other accounts, it was 50. And according to Jean-Paul Marat, which he writes in his newspaper, La Mu de Poupe, the friend of the people, he says it's 400, right? Because he's trying to freak everybody out. So as you can see, we have a very big very large split going on between the revolutionary mindset of we want violence and immediate solutions or we want to keep trying this constitutional monarchy thing, right? So everyone is starting to get their own ideas about the revolution and things are starting to really go sideways. And on top of all of this, right after the Champ de Mar massacre, where the poor are demanding for the head of the king and queen and things like that, the word of this begins to spread. And the monarchs of Europe, in Prussia, 
and in Austria and in places loyal to the king and queen of France. Maybe not necessarily militarily loyal. Why would Prussia ever really care about Louis, right? So like, well, the Prussian king cares about Louis. He cares that if Louis dies, this could inspire the people in his country to revolt as well, right? So like he is beginning to get very upset. You've got the Leopold II in Austria furious that people are threatening and mobs of people are begging for the head of his sister, right? So they issue this thing known as the Declaration of Pilnitz, where several monarchs from several different countries, including Russia, Prussia, Austria, a lot of the O's, and then also several other ones as well, get together and sign a dark document declaring that if any harm comes to the king and queen, that they will directly invade revolutionary France, right? And so revolutionary France is now under threat of invasion, of direct military action of outside monarchs. Things are getting really intense, right? And what a lot of people decide, they're like, look, Obviously, the current government is not working. The revolution is not over. We need to try a legislative body 2.0. We had the National Assembly, also known as the National Constituent Assembly. Now we want a new one, right? And so they decide to elect a new legislative body using limited male suffrage. Notice I said limited male suffrage, right? Limited male suffrage means only certain men are allowed to vote, right? And so the National Assembly is going to be replaced by a very long, 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 long election process going into October of 1791 known as the Legislative Assembly. Assembly. The Legislative Assembly is going to be the very first attempt at a large-scale elected legislative body to try and pass some of the reforms that the liberal phase of the revolution was demanding, right? They pass a lot of different things, too. Like, for example, Maximilien Rossier, Jean-Paul Marat, none of those guys are allowed to serve on it because they all had to sign an order saying, if you served in the National Assembly, you cannot serve on the new Legislative Assembly. It's kind of like a 10-year thing. Like, we don't want you to do it over again. It'll just, like, be, that's us spinning our wheels, right? And so the National, the Legislative Assembly makes uh, better laws for women, right? Like actually allows them to initiate divorce, creates and categorizes the divorce issue, creates is um, creates a law that binds the clergy to have to be loyal to the actual like state. Does a lot of other different little like kind of nitpicky things, but it's just kind of slowly bringing in the ideas of the revolution up until the end of 1791. But what you're seeing going on in the background as well, and they were actually heavily involved in the legislative assembly as well, is the rise of the clubs, right? So, really quick, I don't mean clubs like this. <laughs> no, I don't mean clubs like that, right? Tennis court joke. Uh, like, I don't mean clubs like that. I mean these clubs, right? So you've got basically the first political parties on the rise in France. They all have different demands of the revolution that they want to see happen. They all have different ideas, right? And so Jean-Paul Marat, Maximilien Robespierre, the Marquis de Lafayette, well, the Marquis de Lafayette doesn't really get involved. He's like just stays in the head of the, the National Guard, right? He doesn't really like join a club. But oh, Olympe de Gaulle. Olympe de Gaulle is like just like, oh, wait, I got to join a club. All these different people start joining clubs and these clubs begin to outline their goals of the revolution. So we're seeing splintering off of ideas on how this revolution is supposed to take place, right? You got the most popular and most famous one, the Jacobins, right? So the Jacobins, known very well by their little seal right here that actually has a liberty cap on top of it, is directly wants to create a republic of France. No monarchy, no king, no queen, no privilege, no inherited rights, a direct republic initiated by its people, right? Now you'll notice right here I have the Girondins. Well, the Girondins are going to pop up later. And currently all the people that are going to become Girondins are currently Jacobins, right? And the Jacobins include Maximilien Rosevier, Jean-Paul Barat, and their new buddy, George Danton, right? So like now, then you also have the Foileance and you have the Cordeliers, right? So like you have all these different perspectives that are popping up. The Cordeliers are like kind of like a little radical as well. They don't really want the monarchy. They don't know if they want a direct republic, but they're a little bit in the middle. The Fuelions are like over towards the right. They want to kind of bring back some old aristocratic privileges and stuff like that. So you have different ideas popping up. And the men that have now been elected into this new legislative assembly are a part of these clubs. So you have political parties on the rise that are going on in France, but we just don't call them political parties. We call them factions or clubs, right? 
So the thing about it is the Jacobins are going to be the most famous out of all those clubs. Literally every time a revolt happens in Europe, when they try to insurrect a king or replace them with a new system or something like that, any violent revolt like that is literally going to be called a Jacobite rebellion or a Jacobin rebellion, right? So like Jacobites basically means violent people that want to rise up against the current government, right? What are you doing? Quit sniffing your sister's feet. That's weird. Look, j- Stop it. You're being bad boy. Stop sniffing her feet. Leave her. All right, hold on. Let me go get this dog. Um, all right, anyway, now. Come get P.L. You're French. You should talk about the revolution with me. So anyway, now, the big thing about it, though, is that we're also seeing Europe stand up to the revolution, right? As we can see with the Declaration of Pilnitz, and later on in August of 1792, you'll see this thing called the Brunswick Manifesto, but we won't really talk about that in this class because it's like the Declaration of Pilnitz does that job. Uh, The idea that the Europeans are like the European monarchs are saying, stop the revolution, keep the king and queen safe, or we're going to come right after you, right? Well, the thing about it, though, is following the flight and the Declaration of Pilnitz and the Champ de Mars massacre, the new French assembly actually is going to be like, you want to threaten us, bro? And they're going to declare war on Austria and Prussia. I know. Isn't that crazy? So, like, they declare war directly on Austria and Prussia. It's like, you want to play this game? You want to threaten us? You want to try and pretend like we can't fight for ourselves? Why do you think, though, that Austria and Prussia thought that this threat would work? More than likely to the fact that, because remember, the revolution is not overtaking the entire country. Its heart is in Paris and other major cities, but they think that there's no way that a revolutionary government could organize an army. So they feel as though if they just threaten them, then nothing No harm will come to the king and the queen. But what they didn't expect is that the French revolutionary people are like, oh no, you want to threaten us? Oh heck no. And people begin to enlist in the new national army in mass, right? You've got all these people showing up in the 1790s that are getting really, really, really rowdy and starting to get a lot of intense, very, very over the top experience and getting excited about joining this military. One of them, including a guy that only began, grew to be about five foot seven and was currently an artillery officer in the military during this time. That's right. Napoleon Bonaparte is in his young military career when the French Revolution declares war on Austria and Prussia. So, like, all the stuff is coming together, right? Napoleon is there. All these major players are involved. Maximilian Robespierre, Jean Paul Moreau, like, ah. Yeah, go fight them. We're freaking out. And then also, the Marquis de Lafayette is going to be forced to go off and lead an army in the face of Austria and Prussia. These wars are going to last from 1792 to 1850. And they're called the Wars of the Coalitions, right? Because all these different countries are going to start uniting together to try and stop the revolution over and over and over again, right? So from 1792 to 1797, the war, the first coalition happened. And there's over seven different coalition wars, right? And the only things that ever slowed them down was like the divisions of Poland. So as you can see on this map right here, this is what Polish Lithuania used to look like, right? Now look at the years right here, 1772, 1790, like that says 1795 and then 1756. As you can see, look at what's happening to Poland. Every time there would be a break in one of these coalition wars, or even leading up until this point, little bits of Poland were just getting gobbled up by these other powers. They'd be like, okay, we didn't win that war against France. Let's take a piece of Poland, right? So like, and so Poland is just beginning to disappear and Maria Theresa and then Leopold II are gobbling up parts of it for Austria. And then Frederick William the Great and his descendants are gobbling up parts of, for Prussia. And then you've got over here in Russia, the descendants of Peter the Great are gobbling up parts of Poland and bringing it into the Russian Empire to the point of, by literally this late 1790s, Poland doesn't even exist anymore, right? So the division of Poland is like the only thing that slowed these down or caused breaks during this time period, right? And quick fast forward though, how many of these coalitions do you think, wars do you think they lost? There were seven different coalition wars against revolutionary France. This is fast forwarding all the way to the end of 1815. France only lost one time. So like, what is that going to do to the French revolutionary nationalism? Not only are you a revolutionary state, but you're winning wars against the most powerful countries who are teaming up against you what's going on 
They get so excited, they create a brand new flag. The French tricolor, right? The French tricolor becomes the revolutionary symbol because it's based off the tricolor cockade that the Marquis de Lafayette used to wear when he was supporting the revolution as the National Guard. They turned it into the actual flag itself. So when the new revolutionary army was fighting Austria and Prussia, they were waving this flag. And a man was inspired to write a song to give the men the ability to march off into war. And as you can hear it rising up in the background right now, you can feel the national spirit getting really, really amped up. And I'm going to let you listen to it here for a second. But quick fast forward though. Check this out. It's a very intense song. It's called La Marseillaise. But what it basically means is it's based off the idea of the troops from Marseille or the poor men from Marseille marching off to war against Austria and Prussia. And Marseille's in the south of France. But check out some of the lines from this song. Yeah, I know. Like, it's a very intense song, right? Like, you're talking about watering the fields with the blood of your enemies. That revolutionary song is now the French national anthem, right? Like, so, like, that is so dope. I'm sorry, but I don't love everything French, but, man, their national anthem slaps. It's so good. Now, anyway, rumors, though, because of this, this fervor, this intensity begin to swirl Paris, okay? And they get to go all the way around, and people are like, oh, dude, we're at war now? They declared war in April 1792, pretty much like right off the heels of the French Legislative Assembly being elected, right? And so what you also notice is that a lot of these revolutionary events happen during warmer months, right? So like they happen during warmer months mainly because the winters can be very, very brutal and people are focused on staying alive rather than actually having like a lot of crazy stuff go on during the revolution itself. You very rarely ever see anything happen in January of December. Well, there's one major event in January that happens during the revolution, but it's usually during the warmer months. So as the warmer months are coming back and the harvests are beginning to happen and stuff like that, rumors begin to swirl all over Paris that basically what's going to happen is, oh, if the king and queen are what they want, if the king and queen are what the Austrian and Prussians want so badly, then why don't we just go raid this place, right? And so a giant group of poor people that are eventually going to have a name all their own assemble outside of the Tuileries on August 10th, and they storm into the palace. They kill over a hundred Swiss guardsmen that are hired by Lafayette to actually protect them in this moment, right? And though, oh, also, on top of all of that, and there's so many crazy things happening leading up to this crazy thing. Like, you got Maximilian Rosevier demanding that the Marquis de Lafayette step down as the National Guard leader and the leader of the army, and all this other crazy stuff. And then the Marquis de Lafayette gets arrested by the Prussians during the war. He's locked up outside of France, so he can't come to be the calm voice of reason to get all these people to stop freaking out and destroying this place. But these poor people listening to Maximilian Rosevier and Jean-Paul Marat get all the way to the king and queen. They abduct them. They yank them out of the Tuileries. And they force Louis to wear a hat. Like So they basically take one of the liberty caps and force Louis to wear it on his head and stuff like that. So as you can see, things are getting ridiculous. Our hero, Marquis de Lafayette, is locked up in a Prussian prison by this point. Around September 12th, he's being put on trial. He's being like asked to never come back again. Nobles and aristocrats are fleeing the city and 
and France and running away. They're calling the, them the emigres, right? So like, because they're leaving and running away because they can sense that something's getting insane. But the biggest thing we can sense is that obviously the legislative assembly is not doing a very good job, right? So the legislative assembly is not able to keep the crowds of Paris away from destroying all this stuff, away from storming the Tuileries and taking the king and queen prisoner, right? And they took them prisoner, not even kidding you, in August of 1792, took them prisoner, and then they dragged them to an actual prison and threw them inside of it, right? Louis and Marie Antoinette were thrown into a literal prison by a group of poor people that were getting riled up by Maximilien Rose-Pierre and Jean-Paul Marat and George Danton, right? So as you can tell, without the Marquis de Lafayette there, without Charles Talleyrand there, without the easier-minded people there, the Legislative Assembly is not functioning very well. So since it's failing to govern, they decide to dissolve it and elect a new legislative body. <laughs> like so. But why do you think the Jacobins want this? They want this because they feel like after the storming of the Tuileries, after the like invasions into Austria and Prussia, which are actually yielding a lot of crops and stuff and feeding the people, they feel like this is their moment. That if we start a new legislative assembly, then we'll be the ones universally elected to it, right? And he, they all declare this legislative assembly will not be elected by limited male suffrage. It'll be elected by universal male suffrage. The women are all like, what about us? And Olympia de Gaulle's like, yeah, what about them? And then they're all like, we're getting there. Like, so like, even though ironically enough, this is bananas. Did you know that in France, women couldn't vote until 1944? Like, so like, anyway, but we're not going to get, get into that right now. But elected by universal male suffrage, and this is the breakdown. The new legislative assembly had 749 seats in it, right? And just like, kind of like, much like our House of Representatives, a large number of constituents, right? And I know you're looking at this thing right now and be like, oh no, is that 51% the Jacobins? That's terrifying. Funny enough, it's not, all right? So, like, the Jacobins make up this 26% over here on the left side, right, in the red. The 26% Jacobins are the violent, intense ones. They support the crowds of Paris. They want to abolish the monarchy. They want to get rid of all of that, right? But then you have the Girondinists, right? The Girondins thought that the Jacobins being led by Maximilian Rosevier and those guys were becoming too intense because they were favoring violence over peace, right? And so a new club starts offshot off of the Jacobins, known as the Girondins, and they make up about 21%, right? And then here in the middle are all the undecided, right? They're known as the plain, right? So they're basically a mishmash of all the other smaller clubs, right? The people in the middle that now these two are going to have to convince to get anything passed, right? And so all these different names start popping up during the national, like during the national convention and all these other things are like flying around. But what ends up happening more than anything else though, is three guys start trying to lead the whole thing. And who is it but the Montagnards, right? And the Montagnards is a slang word given to refer to Maximilian Rosepierre, Georges Danton, and Jean-Paul Marat. The Montagnards is any word used to refer to the most radical of the Jacobin sect. And why are they called the Montagnards? Because I know Annabelle is like, wait a minute, that means the mountain, doesn't it? They're called the mountain or the mountain men because when the national convention would meet each other, they would sit really high up on the highest benches that overlooked the entire thing, right? And George Danton apparently the entire time would make fun of the plain and be like, oh, that is not a plain down here. That is the marsh and the people that live in it are toads, right? So as you can see, the Montagnards, they have some ideas and they want things to get violent. And the reason why they want things to get violent is because they have a little army all their own, that they feel like they can use. And it's called the sans culos, right? And again, Annabelle's like, wait, that means pants, yeah. So what this name literally means is no pants, right? So like, or the group without pants, or the no pants gang, right? Now they had actual pants on, they just didn't wear pants like these, okay? So what sans culos means, this militia in and of a sense that Maximilian Robespierre, George Danton, and Jean-Paul Marat feel like they can use to get their things accomplished, the sans culos is going to be the new word that refers to the people that raided the Tuileries, that refers to the people that showed up at the Champ de Mans, right? That refers to all the poor revolutionary citizens that do not wear leggings and leg stockings like bourgeois members do. They wear loose-fitting trousers and working people's clothes. 
The sans culottes includes the poissons or the fishmongering women, the fish wives, the fish moms, right? They are now sans culottes members, right? So the sans culottes members basically means any poor, violent revolutionary citizen, right? And they look like this. That's how you spot a sans culottes member, right? And the sans culottes want violence and they want simple solutions and they want things to change immediately. They do not want things to be passed with laws and stamps and signings and stuff like that. They want things to happen now. And they are already furious that they're at war and that basically what's going on is, oh, wait a minute, we drugged that dude out of there. He's in that prison now. Why aren't we killing him yet, right? So like they want violence. They want blood in the streets they want intensity right that is symbolized by this event right here the september massacres right this event was encouraged by the maximilian rosepierre and jean paul Marat, and they said yeah 